Welcome back. I know it's been a while. I took a little bit of a holiday break, so I wanted to give you a really good one. This is another small cap stock, Foot Locker, that at first glance seems like it's selling for a huge discount. Look at this, PE 5, PB 1.3, price to sales of one half. What? And we're close to a one year low. This is like a perfect storm, potentially. We're gonna see. Before I start though, there's been a lot of comments about, you know, can you do more blue chips? Can you do bigger companies? And I will do those because that seems to be what people wanna see. But in general, it's rarer for those big companies to be at a discount. There's just so much more competition in the valuation of those big companies worth hundreds of billions of dollars or sometimes trillions of dollars. I found that if you're just managing a small amount of money, you can find a lot more price discrepancies in smaller cap stocks. All right, so let's get started. Let's look at this three month chart. So retail in general has been hammered recently and Foot Locker is no different. They are down about 25% from their peak that was in, uh, let's see, November, just mid-November 2021. That's not their one-year peak. That's just their peak over this three-month period. We had some bad earnings come out from people like, I think it was Best Buy and other retail companies, maybe Gap. I'm, I'm not sure, but it kind of trickled down the whole sector. And part of that's due to all this inflation concerns, right? Because if you have high inflation, retail stores are considered non-essentials, right? So they're going to be the ones that are the most affected by high inflation. The companies that are selling essential goods like food or basic chemicals and stuff like that, they're not really going to be as affected by inflation because they're going to be the ones raising their prices and pe and you got to buy them anyway so you just got to pay the higher price it's the non-essentials that are going to get hammered and so that's what people are worried about but that's why i included that quote up top too though it's because charlie munger and warren buffett have said multiple times they did not make their money doing macroeconomic predictions they picked good companies and they said sometimes the tide was with them sometimes it was against them they just swam as best as they could so this may be one of those opportunities let's start with the income statement First up, total revenue, we always make sure it's growing, and it is growing, that's great. This is every quarter going back to 2006, and look at this, this is their COVID quarter, so we're not gonna ding them too hard for that, and it is growing, so that's great to see. Check mark there. All right, what's next? Gross margin. Gross margin, because they're just a buy and resale company, uh, we always like to look at this to judge competitive advantage. So this is pretty impressive. I'm not going to lie. They're able to flip their apparel for on average 35% more than uh, what they buy it from the makers for. That's great. And recently they've been rising. So this would be what I'd be worried about from inflation is that they'd have to cut their prices even though they're going to have a rising raw material cost. So seeing the gross margin stable is actually pretty surprising. A good sign. I still would not expect it to stay there, but that's just me. Hmm. Interesting. Obviously, again, COVID. Hopefully it's over now, right? All right, pre-tax income. Here we go. We're going to get our valuation metric, our first sign that this thing is going to be super undervalued besides the PE of five. All right, so look at this. Um, kind of had a pit there right before COVID, and now we're on the way back up. Recent quarter wasn't so great, and that was retail across the board, which is why you know, the three month chart doesn't look too good. Their next quarter ends at the end of January. They don't end at December like other companies. So you should be expecting their next results to come out about February. But what I'm gonna do here is take the average of these last uh, five quarters. I'm not gonna count the COVID quarters. So here we go. The average of the last five is $324 million per quarter. 324 times four, <laughs> what? 1.3 billion dollars so pre-tax income is 1.3 billion dollars on average a year and they have a market cap of four that's going to be an insane valuation that's awesome all right let's uh what's next growth all right so growth rate i just said what it was 324 and you can see previously it was about 300 about five years ago so what i'm gonna do is just say 324 divided by 300 and raise that to the, what year was this? This was 2015, so raise that to the 1.6. And we get an average annual growth rate of 1.3%. I'm gonna put 1%, stay conservative. All right, and lastly, earnings per share. All right, always diluted earnings per share, right? And let me get decimal points back in here. All right, look at this step up too, wow, that's awesome. Okay, I'm gonna do like I did for the pre-tax income, take the average of the last, uh, I'm going to take the average of the last four, trailing 12 months. So I'm just going to sum the last four quarters. 871. That's super high too. Wow. 871. Okay, so this is what I think is going on. She must have had some pent-up demand that came out 
uh, from all the people who weren't getting their their Foot Locker gear, and then came out because you don't earn four dollars a share out of nowhere after you've been earning one to two for a long period of time but even if it can stabilize around one and a half that's still going to be super undervalued so that's that's awesome big 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 check mark for the income statement this is this is outstanding all right going to the balance sheet first thing we're going to do is look at total tangible assets all right so first thing i want to note here is that like they made some it probably made a big acquisition here. Uh, assets jumped up, big step change. You went from $3.6 billion in tangible assets to $6.7 billion in tangible assets. So what we're gonna do here is get a return on tangible assets. So what I do is I take that pre-tax income, that 1.3 billion, and I'm gonna divide by this number up here, which is, what is that, 7.2? So 1.3 divided by 7.2, that gets me 18% return on tangible assets. That's pretty good. So what's a little concerning is that their total tangible assets doubled in this time period about, what, 2018 to 2020, but their income didn't really change that much. So I'm gonna go back here and show you. So look, they were making, you know, in between one and two, and they're still kind of making that. So I'm hoping that it picks back up because what that would tell you is that you're just getting a terrible return on those new assets that, that you got. It's almost like you bought them for nothing. Not great, that's kind of a red flag. But if it goes back up, if they can get back to this four, that'd be insane. I think that was temporary though. All right, let's go to total liabilities. Yeah, so similar thing to the assets. So they went into a bunch of debt to buy that stuff too. Look, whenever you're gonna make an acquisition, you either do it through equity or debt, they chose debt. The Dave Ramsey fan in me hates that you almost quadrupled your debt to buy something, but I mean, you had $1 billion of debt that was so low, but if it starts working out for them and they start getting more re returns, it'd definitely be worth it. All right, let's go to tangible book value per share. So what this is gonna tell us is all the assets minus all the liabilities, minus all the intangible assets, divided by the number of shares. So this is kind of like a net worth of the company. If it sold all of its tangible assets, paid off all of its debt, this is what it would pay out to the shareholders. So it's about $23 uh, dollars per share, what is, yeah, 24. So real quick, just to get a tangible price to book, what we do is we take the current price, 44, divided by uh, 24, and we get a tangible PB of 1.8. Pretty strong, actually really strong, not gonna lie, but let's look at the return on equity as well. So we said that your tangible equity is $24. This is on a per share basis. So we're gonna take our earnings per share. So $8.71 divided by 24, 36% return on equity, on tangible equity, return on tangible equity. If you do return on equity and not return on tangible equity, you're gonna get a lower number. So just keep that in mind. But in general, 18% pre-tax return on tangible assets, 36% return on tangible equity and a PB less than two, tangible PB less than two, that balance sheet also gets a huge check mark. The only red flag so far has been that uh, acquisition that seemed unnecessary as far as earnings go. Let's go to the cash flow statement. For all right, free cash flow. Bouncing around a lot like we always see with free cash flow, but they don't really have that many big negatives, so I like seeing that. Look, even in the COVID uh, quarter, they lost, they only had one quarter where they had negative free cash flow and they made up for it really quick with, with this one. So pretty strong, not gonna lie. That's surprising and a sign that it's a good, well-run company that they were able to weather that storm. Okay, so I'm gonna do, ooh, I'm gonna be very conservative here. So I'm gonna say the average of the last 15, you know, 16 quarters. So the average of the last four years, and I get $172 million per quarter is the average. 172 times four, $688 million a year, average free cash flow, 688. Okay, and then finally, I'm going to look at dividends, cash dividends, just because I want to show you this. All right, this makes me so happy. So I've ranted about the opposite of this before, but they did the right thing here. So look at this. They were paying a dividend, growing that dividend, you know, making everybody happy. COVID happened and they said, oh crap, we can't pay that. So what did they do? Did they go into debt and continue paying the dividend? No, they stopped it, saved the money, probably were able to invest it wisely during the downturn. And now they're reinstating the dividend. So that's how it should be run. I'm super happy with this. I just wanted to point it out. This would actually get a big check mark for management for me. They, they say you want to invest in companies with good management. It's hard to judge management based on earnings calls and stuff because they're usually all very charismatic and optimistic but to judge them by their actions uh, I, I like that so 
big check mark. All right, well, let's get a valuation. Let's see how good of a discount this thing's selling at. Pre-tax basis, we do 1.3 billion times 10 divided by the number of shares, which is 100 million, so 0.1 billion, and I get $130 a share, what? That's crazy. Earnings per share basis. Okay, so we're gonna do $8.71 times 8.5 plus two times one, so plus two. And we get $91 a share. Also really strong. And then our discounted cash flow method, that's gonna be down here, our free cash flow, it's in billions, so I gotta do 0.688. All right, perpetual growth rate. I'm just gonna match the growth rate at 1% and then discount at 15% and I get a net present value. Let me put some decimals in here of $5.7 billion. So 5.7 divided by the number of shares, you know, $57 a share. All right, let's talk about these valuations. I think this one is extremely optimistic. Now that I think about it, I included the, the COVID recovery quarter without including the COVID quarter. That being said, I went super conservative with the discounted cash flow. And then this one, also, I think I included the COVID recovery quarter without including the COVID quarter. I think it's pretty obvious that it's at a discount. You know what though? Let me go make that adjustment real fast. Um, okay. If I take the last, let's say eight quarters, I get an average of 149 per share, 149 times four. So 596, I'm changing that. All right, so now I'm gonna go get a new pre-tax income. Look, I'm doing this because I wanna be super conservative. I don't wanna lead anyone astray, and most of all, I don't wanna lead myself astray in valuations. Okay, so what I did was I counted this quarter, which was what I referred to as the COVID recovery quarter without counting the actual COVID quarters. So what I'm gonna do is take an average of the last eight quarters. So if I take the average of the last eight quarters, I'm gonna get 221 million dollars per quarter so 221 times 4 is 884 million not 1.3 billion okay i feel much better now let's go back to the valuation and get a different number 884 times 10 divided by 0.1 is going to be 88 dollars a share i don't need the calculator for that and then the earnings per share growth formula is going to be 5.96 times 8.5 plus 2 and i get 63 dollars a share okay much better, much tighter grouping, and closer to the current share price. That being said, it's still at a pretty good discount. Uh, 69 is a 57% upside from the current share price. I think that's a great sign. Am I buying it? Not yet, but I'm doing a lot more research into it now. Uh, then this is the type of criteria I love to see before going deeper into a stock. I will say though, I'm just super, super nervous about the macro economics. I really am not feeling too good about retail with all the high inflation. I talked about that earlier, but it just seems like the last thing you wanna own in a high inflationary period is a company that sells non-essentials. That's just me, and I know that kind of contradicts what, what my quote up top is. I'm trying to kind of convince myself because this, it just seems like a amazing deal. But anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. I'd love to have some discussion on this. If you did enjoy the video, if you learned something, like and subscribe. I'll see you next time.